Mr. Hale, Mr. Jones, how are you? Doing well, how are you? About to say, am I the one with technical issues? Because I, I thought I sounded good. <laughs> I just had to get myself off mute. Happy Monday. There you go. So Rick's going to uh, join us when he gets his, his microphone situation figured out. Perfect. Happy Monday to you. I mean, come on. It's, is this what they call fall? I guess yeah. it's rainy and not hot, but not cold and yeah, fall. It's like the lingering right? trail of summer. Goodness. <laughs> You know what I love about fall is uh, it, it, we, we show up with two jobs, Mark. You know, we, we're busy in our business, work in our business through the right. end of the year. But we start thinking about eh, maybe I need to start planning for next year. Right. So all of a exactly. sudden we got two jobs instead of the normal one job. Right. But uh, it, in, in terms of, of the market, hopefully uh, you've done great preparation and marketing. And your business stays hot. Right. Right. And we, we, we do know just from a seasonality perspective, uh, real estate sales typically are hotter in the summer and taper off a little bit in the fall. Sure. However, it doesn't always happen that way, right? We what's have a lot experience? of agents whose busiest month is December. Yeah. So what, what's kind of your experience? You've been in the industry a long time. What yeah. does the fall in real estate look like? Yeah, so I think it is busy for most folks. If you've been doing the work all year long, you're going to continue to see the the fruits of that, you know, because whatever uh, someone does in May, June, July shows up in August, September, October. So if they're if they took the summer off, they're probably not going to see a lot of business, and they're having to ramp up right now to get right. business for the end of the year or first of the next year. If people have been being consistent and doing lead gen, whatever that means to them, um, consistently, then they're probably going to have a busy uh, last quarter of the year. Yeah, well, I mean, we talk about, you know, uh, Wednesday, Mark, is 100 days left in 2021. And yep. we're, we're 102 days. So 100 days is Wednesday. But we also talk about how October 1st is such a big day because it's 90 days from 2021 or 2022. Ooh, yes. And in business, everything you do today shows up 90 days later. Correct. So every the people that are having success now laid that groundwork back when everybody else was on vacation in the summer, right? right. It's, it's all that work, right? Well, yeah, let's jump absolutely. in. Rick, are you with us? I think so. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. So let's jump in. So here's the numbers for the week. Um, there's the graph, but let's go to the numbers first. So new listings, FMLS is our stores. Uh, last seven days was 1,297. We're holding that 1,300 listing number a week, which I think just goes to show that the market's optimistically staying pretty strong right now uh, on new inventory coming on the market, no? Absolutely. It's consistent. Yeah. Now you look at the pendings and we bounced a little bit on pendings, but 1,145 pendings is a little less than last week. But if you look at the weeks before, pretty good number holding there. So here we are sitting over halfway through the month of September, which I think in a lot of people's minds, uh, they expect the market to taper off in September. And it's not really tapering off, although some of the national media is, is saying that. And we'll jump into some of the articles here in a little bit. Um, but look at the closings. 1,859 closings. Now, I almost feel like some of that was supposed to happen the week before and we're somewhere in the middle of all that because we had a low week the week before, but it's still a pretty hot volume of, of real estate transactions happening in Metro Atlanta. What would y'all add? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a little bit of a, uh, you saw a little dip at the end of last week and then a bump this past week and the 15th fell on a um, weekend. So it seems like people either want to close on the 15th or the 31st for some reason or the 30th. So um, it's kind of an old school mentality, but we still do it. So Mark, I think if we have one goal, closings. we have one goal of industry updates. It's to dispel the myth that yes. you have to close property on the 1st and the 30th. You can close the any day of the week and don't close yes. on Monday mornings. Yes, <laughs> there you go. That's the myth we're going to dispel. Rick, what would you add? Here's the graphs. 
I mean, there's just set the reporting cycle of when people plug in and when it shows up on our graph could be seven days left or right anyway. And it just seems to me, I mean, looking at 30 day averages, we've been on a pretty balanced pace for quite some time, which should be inspiring. You know, what you don't want to see is dramatic swings left and right, which would indicate other outside forces. Right. Perfect. Well, uh, I want to show everybody something real quick. Um, we created a marketing piece that's going to be popped out on Instagram before the end of this call. So it's just a simple Instagram post said, here's those same stats we just went over. Uh, we're going to put it up on the Heart of Atlanta Instagram page. And you can share this to your stories, to your database, right? Whatever commentary makes the most sense to you and personalize it, right? But here's the graphic already created. Uh, Pierce, our marketing director with the easy button created this. So uh, just know that we're, we're behind the scenes pumping value to you on marketing and content. So you can take this information and get it out there to the masses. Um, anything else you guys would add around those numbers? I would just say you want to create intrigue. So I would send the numbers and go, you know, the market continues to be robust and consistent. If you want to better understand how this might impact you and your goals with real estate, let's have a conversation. There you go. What would you add, Mark? Yeah, I mean, it's really just asking questions and engaging people, right? So it's more like, you know, here's what's happening in the market. You know, like Rick said, ask a question. If you want to learn how this is impacting you, reach out to me, like, you know, how does this affect your plans for 2021? There you go. All right, so on the residential lease side, not a lot of data here that is really shocking. The lines are still holding pretty constant trend lines. Uh, and we've talked about that. And just know, we also do a Northwest Georgia mm -hmm. statistic. If you ever sell up in the three counties Northwest of, of Cobb County, um, we do a Northwest Georgia stat just like this one. All right, so Mark, you sent me a, 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 an article around Fly Homes wants to eliminate contingencies. Yeah. Is that crazy? <laughs> so What's this I, about? This is a brokerage that's basically doing what um, Homeward and other companies are doing where they're providing funds to help people buy before they sell or a bridge loan to facilitate a transaction. Um, but it's interesting because they, they're like a Redfin type model where they have salaried agents, they have a pricing department, a marketing department, um, you know, so every, the, a closing department, so they have every different aspect is its own specialist. So it's not one person guiding you through the transaction. It's like this machine doing it. And it's just, I thought it was just an interesting take on both the agents as a salaried individual model like Redfin's doing, but also combining that with the thought process. And there was a phrase in there that I, I that really kind of jumped out at me. And it was something about, um, let's see, I don't think I have it up in front of me. It says something about, um, we thought like, why shouldn't all homes, uh, why shouldn't all buyers and sellers have cash offers? Like just taking that out of the equation completely so that yep. the financing isn't part of the stress and fear that makes buyers and sellers act. I believe that every consumer should have the power of a cash offer, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's the interesting thing, Mark. Um, our, our agents have these kind of tools at their fingertips. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously it, that we can always do a better job of communicating, but I also want to encourage people that, hey, there's a lot of tools out there you probably should go learn more about. Homeward being one of them, Keller sure. Offers being one of them. Yeah. Uh, learning all these, uh, these tools that bring this kind of thought process to the table uh, is really a big part of the real estate of the future. And uh, we're going to continue to partner and bring solutions to the table where but it's really the burdens on the real estate agent to get that message out to the consumer because we're right. not going to sidestep you and just start marketing it you it's really you and your relationship with your database mm -hmm. and i think some agents out there have done a really great job saying you know 
you want to sell your house, here are your options. Here's, here are different ways we can do it. Everything from, you know, I can help you sell it to iBuyers to, you know, a fully, you know, uh, a robust experience on marketing it uh, robustly and, and getting top dollar for it. So, and everything in between, and they're all priced differently. So um, I think it's going to be become more and more a menu of services that we've been talking about forever, but didn't really happen. I think it's starting to happen. Yeah. It's definitely starting to happen. And it's certainly price point specific. So uh, a lot of these services, they don't really touch the over 600 price point that much. So it's your typical uh, um, medium price homes that are really getting affected and disrupted by this innovation to our industry, so to speak. Right. So if you're somebody that sells million dollar plus houses all the time, yeah, maybe it's not as important, but I, th I still would say it'd be naive not to know. Um, however, this is really the disruptive in the uh, medium price point areas, right? Sure. Where the same areas the eye buyers are disrupting, same areas everybody uh, is, is uh, venture capital money is going after, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. Which brings me to my next article. So there is a guy named Stephen Swanpool who's like a trend expert in our industry. And he pumps these uh, magazines out once a year, which is all the trends that are going on in our industry. And you can certainly reserve a copy. And I, I think it's great reading to understand the direction of our industry. Um, however, uh, you can see down here, it says, here's what's new in the 2020 Swan Pool Trends Report. Understanding private equity. I think private equity has made its way in a big way into our industry. And what does that look like, right? Mm -hmm. uh, understanding the technology consolidation, the great reshuffling, accelerations getting faster. Which one speaks to you? And give me your intelligence, Mr. Jones. Well, um, actually, two different things. One is yep. the um, reshuffling, because I think that's the, the most unique thing that we're experiencing is the, um, how COVID has affected how, we, how and where people work and where, how and where they live. So that was the first thing. And I, I think it's interesting because in Atlanta, we ha haven't seen as much of the migration out of the city into the suburbs. There's certainly some happening, um, but we're seeing, if anything, people coming from expensive cities, more expensive cities to our city. Um, so it really hasn't, we haven't seen a big dip in, uh, urban uh, real estate sales. But the other thing I was noticing because I watched the uh, um, Netflix documentary on uh, WeWork this past weekend was just the whole private equity thing and the impact that that has on these industries um, and how a lot of them are operating at these huge losses and that's only sustainable until they get to a point where they wanna go public and they realize, oh, we have to make money. Yeah. There, there's a, a day of reckoning with every business around profit. Um, the, the question is, is how far out that day of reckoning is, right? For sure. Rick, which one speak to you? What are you seeing? I mean, they all do, to some degree, they all yeah, do. But course. understanding, I think private equity, what's happening now, or, you know, we've had such a, we've had a 10-year run where people who have money have made more money than they've ever made. And there's been success in just about every quadrant. And the uncertainty of the stock markets pushed people to diversify. And real estate's a real play. I mean, it's and it's not what it used to be where you would just buy debt and carry it at a, a predetermined you know, interest rate, hoping to either run it out or resell it yourself. Um, so I, I think there's lots of money available and people want deals and they feel this level of comfort that's hedged in real estate. So you know, raising funds for multifamily. I mean, it's easy as picking up, you know, literally picking up your phone, call 10 people with money and eight or nine of them will put money into a real estate fund. At least that's been my experience of late. So there's just a lot of capital until the market dips and fear creeps in. I think people are also willing to take lower rate of return. So, you know, five, six percent, you know, what used to be a, a multiple you'd consider in real estate, you know, seven, eight, ten years ago. Today, you might compromise that also combined with the reality that interest rates are so low. So your money sitting stagnant does nothing. And people would rather, rather at least have it in, in play somewhere. 
And the scary part is, to your point, Brett, that once these people collect all that capital, they've got to do something with it. They can't sit on it because they're they're not garnering great a great return in the bank either. So I think they're making some interesting decisions and probably spending money differently than they would if it was their own. So that was a whole lot of information around private equity. But um, I think there's some risk involved right now because people are, are you know, the sky's blue and everyone thinks it's staying blue and it doesn't stay blue forever. And people are investing simply to move money because they have to. Um, and, well, but we've yeah. been hanging out in double digit price appreciation, which, you know, if, if somebody has a hundred grand, and they and they they're they're wanting to invest a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, an eight to ten percent return on their money is probably pretty good in most standards, right? You uh, you went into the stock market, eight percent would be considered pretty good on your money, right? Yeah, um, well, real estate if it's safe. If it's safe, well, real estate perception wise, a little bit of a safe investment right now, and the returns are double digit, almost guaranteed over the last couple of years. So of course the money's moving in and real estate uh, by any stretch of the imagination is the biggest wealth creator creation vehicle out there. Uh, and you think about like venture capital used to play in the dot-com world, right? And they would go invest in these, these people and try to strike it rich and, and lots of people lost lots of money because they were betting on people. Now they're betting on real estate and real estate's a better bet, right? We know that because we're in the industry. Um, but you, I mean, you look at the uber wealthy of America, like them or not, the Warren Buffetts or the Donald Trump. I mean, these are all kind of tied in some aspect back to real estate, right? Yeah. Um, so it just kind of tells venture capital, this is a good play. And to some regard, we benefit from that uh, because we're in the industry. In other regards, it's a it's a risk to us. So yep. we're just learning to navigate it, right? Well, and, and they're playing in the single family sector now more than ever. So, you know, for a long time it was commercial and then multifamily and the, even single family looks like a deal. Like to your point, 10% appreciation makes everybody look like a hero. And the other thing that it could affect is what percentage of the market do they control the day when the day comes that they decide to liquidate and the effect on supply and demand. So it's just another consideration to keep an eye out for. You know, and the other thing, uh, just going off, off script a little bit, I, I wrote down a number and I think I shared it last week. It's like $173,000 is the average amount of equity in, in a homeowner has in their house right now. And I may be off by a few thousand, but I'm pretty sure it's close to that. And I think we've got to change our language around, hey, let me talk to you about what your house is worth to let me do an equity consultation with you. Let me, let me come in and do a, a consultation around how much equity you have in your house. Uh, and, and that speaks to wealth instead of sales. Uh, let me sell your house. No, let me, let me protect your equity. Let's talk about that. And, and it's a powerful conversation, but it's the same conversation these venture capitals are ha having at much, a much bigger scale, right? All right, student loan debt. This gets a little crazy. So what it says is 60% of millennials are delaying buying a house because of student loan debt. And Here's where this gets into a perspective. So if you go back in comparison, Gen Xers, it was 53%, 37% of baby boomers, and 39% of Gen Zers. And I'm trying to keep up with all the letters, but I think the bottom line is millennials are getting hit the worst with student loan debt and it's affecting their ability to buy houses. What do y'all make of that? Mark? I'm, I'm a little bit, so I'm a little on the fence about this because I think there's also millennials are the most likely to have the ability to move back in with their parents at this point. You know what I mean? So I think that that's a little bit of it. Um, you know, it happened right at the, uh, the tail end of the recession last year. So I think some of this is, um, is debt itself because it is student loan debt is crippling, but I think some of it is also 
um, for lack of a better word, cultural uh, among millennials. Sure. I mean, COVID mean had that? a COVID had a de definitive impact on the percentage of of you know young kids and young adults that move back home, and and culturally, I think a lot, for a lot of us, it was actually a welcomed experience. And my guess is at some point it won't be as welcomed again. So there may be a push to get get their uh, young adults onto the road of self sufficiency and self you know dependency. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where this is like five years from now. Right. Yeah, there's a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, NYU business professor uh, named Scott Galloway, who's written some books and is, is kind of perceived as maybe a top 10 business mind out there in the education world. And what's interesting about Scott is just side note, uh, we all talk about who are the people that influence our thinking and who do we seek out that are thought leaders? Well, Scott Galloway is one of a handful of thought leaders that Gary Keller follows, just a uh, little side note here. But he talks about the higher education industry is the most ripe for being disrupted. He says the amount of money we're paying and the amount of debt we're taking on is not valuing what the education brings to us after we graduate. It's becoming disproportionate. And he predicts that this is gonna be severely disrupted in the future. Um, so to Mark's point, what's it going to look like five years from now? I mean, I mean, you almost, uh, obviously we can get into an opinion here and yeah. we don't need to, but uh, bottom line is our industry is certainly being affected by student loan debt. And I think it also is being affected by the housing shortage <laughs> around first time home buyers, which is either going to create a, a backlog of people that are going to want to buy these medium price uh, first time home homes in the near future, or it's just a disruptive conversation is what it is. It also speaks to like the experience um, that institutions are having to provide now. I know I saw something the other day talking about universities because of the pushback on price, they're really having to rethink what is the experience that you get at this university that you can't get by watching YouTube, right? So it's not information anymore because now everyone has access to the information. So what is the experience? And what I take from that is it's like- not you know, keg our, parties, Mike? It, well, I, for me, that was a big part of my college experience. Yes, I understand. Uh, fraternities and, you know, yeah. I, I see it as uh, management and leadership uh, training, but, you know, see how you will. Yeah, um, you but I think as agents, I think the takeaway for that is how are we providing a better and better experience for our clients because our industry is getting disrupted already and our value is there, but we have to make sure that we're providing a better value than um, some of these disruptors. So it's like, how are we pre creating that value for our clients? Or how to help somebody pay off a student loan debt faster by buying a piece of property that's going to appreciate and sell right. it and move on and and use real estate to as a debt service right right or when you work with this agent do you is there is there a group of that agent's people that they've curated that is an investment club that has a certain return you know what i mean like i think there's going to be all sorts of value adds like that that we never really thought of you know 20 years ago when i got in business that's awesome all so, right so there's the, a, one more thing ahead. The conversation should also be with your clients around the millennial, you know, your you, you know, grown kids living at home and maybe how you, you could promote a conversation around the compelling nature of them supporting and helping either, um, you know, you know, co what's the term when you on the loan, when you, um, co -sign. huh? Like co-sign. Co yeah. Co-sign or down payment assistance from a relative or, I mean, there's creative ways. Like, is it time to not just push your kids out of the nest, but help them start creating wealth and, a, and to Brett's point, developing a path that helps enable paying back those loans. And right. I still scratch my head around the cost of education, given the scalability and the capacity to do it online. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. My son just mentioned he had to buy some books and um, needed funding and they were as expensive as the heart. They were more expensive, frankly, than books back in the day where you actually had a physical book. It's an ebook. And I'm like, what happens when you're done? He goes, it just goes away. And I'm like, you don't get to resell it. 
<laughs> you know, like I used to go looking for that the was, one. That was the best book. part. You'd take oh, it back to the bookstore. And yeah. Get money. And when you bought your book, buying used was the bomb because somebody's, you know, if you're smart, you get a book that's like well rehearsed and has cool <laughs> notes. But, but anyway, times are changing and, and you would think scalability and technology benefits the pricing model, but it hasn't actually transcended that. And that's the fear in the real estate business is the, the other side of it is still available that these disruptors have access to your clients differently than they ever have. Perfect. So real quick, this is a National Association of Realtors. They always put out reports and stuff and research. They're a big research firm. Um, and this is a profile on 2021. So it's, it's current. And there's a little line in here where it talks about um, firms typically generated 30% of their sales volume from past client referrals, 30% from repeat business from past clients. That's 60% of the business is coming from current or repeat customers uh, through a database-based business. There's the stats, right? 10% coming from the website. And Mark, how many agents stress out about their website? Um, all of them. <laughs> of them. A, a vast uh, majority think it's disproportionately important to their business when it's really not. There you go. And 10% through social media. Okay, social media, I think, is still a database part, but that's just my opinion. But anyway, it still goes to show our industry is still a relationship-based industry. It's all about having a solid database, communicating effectively with it, and staying in touch and maintaining those relationships. It right. really hadn't changed that much, has it? Mm -hmm. No. No. And it's a gift because that's the that's the disruptor of the disruptors. Because if, yeah. if we're still getting 60% from relational energy and past conversations converted to current, that's something they're going to have trouble penetrating continually. Yep. So I wanted to pull this article up, and this one's on Housing Wire, I believe. Yep. And uh, it's the title says "Red Hot U.S. US Housing Market Begins to Cool," and here's what it says: less offers, but still the same volume of houses selling. Um, the market has slowed down, but if you look at the lag indicators, you're not going to see it yet. And it says there are fewer bidding wars and few homes that are selling above the asking price um, is what this red bin report uh, finds. Um, but at the end of the day, we've been talking about this for a while, like the, the volume of the multiple offers is slowly gone down. And when that goes down, the homes aren't necessarily selling for crazy amounts of money over asking price, waive the appraisal, cash only. Um, and this is really where I think our industry update is, is important because this is what agents need to get into their head and into their consultations with their clients because you've got to have data to back it up because their friends are telling them they got 50K cash back in April and they want to know why they can't do it today. And you've right. got to have some data to back it up. And this is just one of those articles. What would y'all add? Well, two takeaways for me. One is that uh, while it is slowing down, we as agents need to not be chicken little and think the sky is falling because um, it went from 50 point, uh, down to 50.1% from 55% of homes uh, selling above asking price, right? So it's not like this, the bottom is falling out. Oh my God, the bubbles burst, but it's slowing down. It's just, it's gradual. So like we yeah. all need to take a deep breath and be like, okay, okay, that's cool. So that's one takeaway. Um, and then the other one is just the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it on here. Oh. It, it's, it's, it's the constant education that we need to be doing. We need to be constantly telling people what's happening this week um, yeah. because it's not only hyper local, but it's hyper current. And, you know, when March 14th, 15th, last uh, 2019, uh, 2020 rolled around, the market changed in a day. So you weren't dealing with last week, you were dealing with this week, which was a global pandemic, right? So yep. I think we need to remind people that real estate is hyper local, but it's also hyper current. Perfect. And, and just goes to speak, why do we track these numbers every week? It feels so redundant, like. No, because that's how you got to stay current. 
and, and t this week's data is different than three weeks ago. And if you want to be a skills-based agent, that's, I mean, that's what you got to do, right? Yeah. If, if I were selling right now, I would be taking notes on this every week and doing my own spin on it to my clients and saying, here's this week's update. So that you become that source of information for your clients, the economist of choice for your your sphere. Yep. And and here's the thing: I think we probably mentioned a thousand times, and we should mention a thousand more. Media companies take the extremes because it causes people to read the story. The truth right. is, um, the truth's always in the middle somewhere, and um, we we could choose to only come on this call and just. Uh, paint the picture as rosy red but the truth is that it doesn't serve anybody good so we're going to talk the good the bad the ugly just so we're all prepared to go navigate and know how to win winning doesn't determine whether these numbers are good bad or ugly it determines how we respond to them right yeah, yeah I'm not winning. Winning. go ahead Rick. i was just saying winning really has nothing to do with what you or i think it's what your client thinks and when you propose creative and unique angles on information, hopefully, you know, the ultimate game is to continue a conversation that keeps you in the conversation. When the moment comes that they decide to buy, sell, or invest, you're the first, first person they think of. There you go. Thank My you. Last Big Hill, that, is, was, that, is, uh, was, that was very uh, profound. That was very profound. <laughs> um, I cut Mark off to get there. Sorry, Mark. What was your hey, last thought? Have last that, thought. I'm rushing to get in there because I know we're over. Um, so I just wanted to bring up, I think Sean Dammon, I think it was last week, made a really great um, observation and used a, some language I love, which is um, using the term normalizing, that the market is starting to normalize. It's not normal yet, but it's certainly less abnormal than it's been, right? So yeah. I think using the right language, I think... We have to remember that we play a role in how real estate is perceived locally and we it's we are sort of stewards of the market so we have to be careful how we project things um so i th thought that was a brilliant term normalizing absolutely all right guys we're two minutes over and we try to always end on time we love you and we thought that was worth it bye take care good to see you